Welcome. We're excited you're here as well. It's the week after Easter. Wasn't that a phenomenal experience, you guys? Amazing, outpouring. I'd love to share with you the results. We always do this every year because we love reaching people and reaching new people with the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you what happened on Easter Sunday. We reached 1,938 people right here at Southwest. Almost the 2,000 mark. But this is the first time as a network we reached over 2,000 people, 2,328 people at all of our four campuses of Discovery Church. Man, God is good. And then this is, this is a, a number that means more than a number to us because every number is a name and every name has a story. Amen, you guys. Salvations, 240 commitments to Christ. Heaven was just elated and erupted with all the names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is 10% of our attendance. You guys see that? 10% of the people that came actually committed their life to Christ. I was talking to one of those people uh, in the first service, and they said, Pastor Jason, I, I took the challenge, the one-year challenge. I'm going to give God one year and just to see what he's... But, I, but he said, I have to tell you, Pastor Jason, already seven days into it, and my life is so much better. Come on, give God some praise, you guys. <clears throat> Here's the survey results for those of you that joined us on, on Easter. We do that Easter survey, A, B, C, and D, kind of what category are you in and stage of your spiritual life. For the A's, the A's were the already believe, 516 of you. B, those people just at this campus that committed their life to Christ and checked off B was 193 people. 36 of you, which I love, 36 people said, you know what, I'm considering it. I need to consider it a little bit more, which is so cool. I love even that we have... 3D. Some of you are like, I don't care, and I don't like it, and I don't ever intend to. I love that we, I love that you're here, and I hope you're still here, because in, at any point of our Easter experiences that we have no Ds, something's wrong. If we're not reaching people who are far away from God, who are still considering or not even considering, then we're doing something wrong. But I love that we're reaching people who are far away away from God. So we're in this brand new series today, kind of pivoting, turning the corner now after Easter in a series we're calling Rebel King. Really what we're doing is, is we want to discover or rediscover the Jesus that you probably never knew. So like what comes to your mind when you think about Jesus? What is your mental picture when you think of Jesus? And you know, Jesus, when he came on the scene 2,000 years ago, he didn't come the way people thought he would come. He didn't look like people thought he would look like, sound like. He didn't do what people thought he would do. He was, he was this rebel king. And, he, and still today, thousands of years later, I believe that we still are, the picture we have, a lot of people have in their mind of Jesus is, is not the real Jesus. So maybe, let me, I, I brought some pictures, some famous or, you know, pictures that you guys, so when you think of Jesus, you might see like the Easter crucified. That might be the image that you think of. You might think of the somber or the serious, you know, Jesus, he's crucified, you know. That might be your picture. Or maybe for some of you super spiritual ones, it's the resurrected, mystical, standing with Aslan, the lion from Lion, Witch of the Wardrobe, and the lamb, and it's just some mystical, you know, resurrected figure kind of, kind of thing. And, and, and the, a popular one for a lot of people, though, is, is, you know, the Jesus that, like, looks sick, He's glowing, though, and stuff. It's that, it's that Catholic picture of Jesus, like on the candle. This is, Jesus is serious, you know. Jesus is very serious, you know. He's just, he's glowing even. And so this is like the picture a lot of us, or for some of you, you share this picture of Jesus on Facebook. <laughs> Y'all, please help me, man. Come on. That, that ain't Jesus. They're making fun of us, you guys. Can Jesus get 100 likes? No. Who is this, you guys? Obi-Wan Kenobi, man. Come on. That's Obi-Wan. Stop it. Stop it. And if you're one of those people, can Jesus get, stop it for the love of Jesus. Please stop sharing that. They're making fun of us. So what is, what is your picture that you have when you think of Jesus? Because listen, he's not a picture. He's not a photo. He's not a poem. He's not a story. He's a person. He's a real person person. And this is the beauty of Christianity, you guys. The, the miracle of it is that you can actually have a real relationship with a real God, okay? So here's the, the, the big idea, really. First John chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, um, John actually says the reason why we're even writing scriptures, look, he says the infinite life of God himself took shape before us. He says, man, we, we saw it and we heard it like it, 
It took shape. Did you guys know that you're supposed to see and hear? He, he says, look, we, we saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you so that you can experience this too. Like, we're not the only ones. We can't be the only ones to see this, man. We can't be the only ones to hear it. We can't be the only ones to experience it. Hey, we're writing all this down so that you would experience this. What do you want you to experience? He says, the experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That we were to have this idea of communion is, is relationship. It's fellowship that that it was always meant to be intimate and personal. We were always meant to hear and see and experience Jesus. Our motive for writing this is simply this. He said, we want you to enjoy this too. One translation says, he, he, he says, I'm writing this that your joy may be full. Do you know God wants you to enjoy life? That he wants you to experience the joy of experiencing Jesus. The scriptures were written so that you can experience Jesus as they did, that you would see him, that you would hear him, that you would experience him personally. Here's the big idea of, of, this, of this series. The ex, to experience the real power, real peace, the real life that God has to offer you, we must have a real relationship with the real Jesus. That's, that's, that's important for us to understand. The power of our Christian faith, again, is in a personal, real relationship with the real Jesus. But what does that mean? What does that mean when, when, we, when we talk about a personal relationship with Jesus? Because when we, when we say that, some of us say that, but what does that mean practically in our lives? For, so for some of us, practically what it means to have a real relationship with Jesus is that you have a, you have a relationship with the church. So, so you, you, you attend a church, you go to this church, you're part of that church, you serve there, give there, do this, go to that. And, and look, a relationship with the church is, is, is nothing compared to a relationship with Jesus. It is, it's not the same thing. Now, should you have a relationship with the church? Absolutely. But your motivation and foundation, I want to make sure, is, is in the right place. Because your personal relationship with Jesus may be either a relationship with the church or for some of us, some of us say, oh yeah, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I love worship. I love worship music, and I love, look, do you know that God is not seeking scholars? He's not seeking, you know, worship lovers, music lovers, entertainment lovers. He's seeking true worshipers, Amen. ones who worship Him in spirit and in truth, the Bible says. It does not substitute for a relationship, a real relationship with Jesus. Or for some of us, it's maybe... Um, a personal relationship with Jesus means practically for us that we have a personal relationship with the Bible. I read my Bible, I study my devotions, and when I'm doing that, I feel close. When I'm not doing that, I don't. And again, all these things are great. I want you to read your Bible, okay? But, but we're missing the point. You're, we're missing, actually, Jesus told the, the religious leaders in John chapter 5 that they were missing the point because the religious leaders knew their Bibles, okay? They knew the scriptures and they missed the point. They missed Jesus altogether. He told the religious leaders, you're busy analyzing the scriptures, frantically pouring over them in hopes of gaining eternal life. Everything you read, he said, you missed the point, guys. That's not, the point wasn't, the point of reading your Bible wasn't just to read your Bible. The point of reading your Bible wasn't to memorize scripture. That's not the point. The point of reading your Bible wasn't to give you more wisdom. That's not the real point. God, now, does that stuff happen? Absolutely. But Jesus is telling them, you're missing the point. The point of the scriptures was that you would know me. I'm the point. I'm the point of all your serving, all your giving, all your reading. It's all, it was so that it would point to me. Yet he says, you still refuse to come to me so that I can give you this real power this real peace, this real life that you're looking for. You're looking for it, but you're missing it. You're, you're making it more complex than it needs to be. I can offer you real, eternal life, Amen. a real relationship with the real Jesus. Jesus is saying, you need to know me. That's the point, to know him. Now, psychology states that what a personality is, the personality of someone is the sum total of their physical mental, emotional, and social characteristics of an individual. That's their personality. So here's, when we lose his personality, we lose Jesus. Are you hearing me on this, church? This is, this is important to where we're going. When you strip away 
the personality of Jesus, all that is left is empty religion. And I think for, for so many years, we have read the scriptures and studied faith and Christianity in Jesus with this sterile picture of a monotone, serious Jesus, and it's robbing him of his personality. And when there is no personality, you cannot know someone personally Amen. unless you know their personality. Where there is no personality, there's no person. Where there is no person, all you have is the poison of religion. Hey, I believe that this series and this journey we're going on over the next four weeks is it has the power to change your walk with Jesus. It really does. How you relate to Jesus personally, it can change your walk of faith. And I, for the, especially for the first two messages in this series, this today and next week, I'm going to stretch you a little bit. For some of you, I'm going to stretch you a lot in studying Jesus' personality, especially those of you that have been in church for a long time. All right, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to uncover, rediscover really the personality of Jesus that we've sterilized, that we've stripped him of. We forget that he was fully God, but he was fully man. He experienced everything in human nature. And so I'm going to stretch you a little bit, because and you're going to want to give me some pushback on this, because this is Je not my Jesus, because you want to keep Jesus here, and you think that by keeping him here in this mental thought of the glowing Jesus, that somehow you're honoring him, and you're disconnecting from him. Honor Jesus. Reverence Jesus. But make sure it's a real relationship with the real Jesus. So we're going to study these, these parts of Jesus, because there's a lot of his personality that we can, we can, we can really uh, uncover and study. But we're going to study kind of these missing, if you will, parts of Jesus' personality that, um, that I think have gone unnoticed. Because G Jesus isn't a figure. He's, he's meant to be your friend. He's meant to have, a, you were meant to have a personal relationship with him. So before we study, though, kind of the personality to introduce this topic, I kind of, I want to uncover the, the poison of religion. Because what happens when we remove the personality for Jesus, from Jesus, the poison of religion comes into our life and our faith. So how do we know? How do we know that we, uh, or how can we identify that we maybe have ingested some of the poison of religion? Unknowingly, I mean, we love, we love God, we want to love Jesus, but maybe unknowingly the poison have, of religion has crept into our faith and into our walk. Take some notes with me, because when the poison of religion is operating, some things happen. Check it out. Knowing about God substitutes for knowing God. Knowing about God substitutes for knowing God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, actually states this so clearly. Jesus talks about this on the importance of knowing him. He says, not everyone who says to me, look, Lord, Lord, not only everyone who says, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, many will say to me, not just a few people, but there's going to be a lot of people who think they're doing it right, who think that they know him, who actually on that day, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do a whole bunch of Christian things? I went to church. I was a member of the church. I was a part of that group. I served. I gave my tithes. I did it. I prophesied in your name. I, I, I drove out demons, and in your name, I even performed miracles. But Jesus tells him, look at this. He tells him plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. When knowing about God substitutes for knowing God. This Greek word for know here is gnosko. It literally means to intimately know a person. It's the same word that was used when it said that Mary knew, did not know Joseph when she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. It is an intimate. Jesus, Jesus says, look, you missed the point again. It wasn't about all that stuff that you were doing. That doesn't replace knowing me personally. That is, that is the poison of religion. Or here's number two. When false reverence replaces loving Jesus. So what's false reverence? Like a false, false honoring, false respect. Let me give you a few examples. When I was younger and I knew Jesus, but really didn't know Jesus, I was, you know, still partying and drinking and, and doing all that kind of stuff. I, I, I would be with my friends and, and partying, and then I was that guy that you could not use the Lord's name in vain around. If you use, uh, I'd be a beer in one hand, a joint in the other. Don't you say that about my Lord. You know, just what in the world? 
just so foolish, you know? And Jesus talks about this. Why do you clean the outside of the cup when the inside is so filthy, like a false reverence is somehow holy or holier than cleaning the inside of your heart and your life? Or maybe you've heard, you've been around a religion or a church for a while where you can't wear a hat in the sanctuary of God. You just, that's just, where do we get that? Or when we first started, people would get mad at me because my holy jeans, you know, and I'm wearing jeans, they're holy, amen, somebody said. Yes, they are. They sure are. That's, that is this false reverence that replaces truly loving Jesus. So you can be a good Christian, do good moral things, do good things, and you're a good Christian, and it replaces somehow someone loving Jesus personally and intimately. False reverence. That's when you know the spirit of religion is operating, when false reverence is, replaces truly loving and being in love with Jesus. Our religion becomes more about what we're doing or not doing than who we're knowing and who we're loving. Here's one that can be hard to expose as religious because at least there's miracles operating, but this is, this is one that power displays are confused with intimacy with Jesus. Oh, wow, that, that person must be close to God. I mean, look at the way they pray for people and they're healing and there's miracles back to Matthew chapter 7. Did not Jesus say that people would prophesy and do miracles? And so, Listen, people chase the signs and the wonders instead of chasing Jesus. And that's where the religious sometimes can, can operate, where we're chasing the miracle instead of knowing the miracle worker. Miracles do not substitute for relationships. When the religious is operating, people chase signs and miracles instead of chasing Jesus. Here's the last one I'll give it to you. And that is that religious activity is confused with commitment to Christ. Oh, you know what it means to be close to Jesus and you have a relation with Jesus is you go here and you do that. You go to this group, you attend here, you serve here, and you serve over there. Then you give this and, 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 and you just go over. Religious activity does not necessarily mean you're close to Jesus. Now, again, we want you to do those things. There's, there's purpose in those things, but void of personal relationship, a real relationship. You know what? That's why so many people are up and down with their faith. That's why so many people are in and out and hot and cold because you can only put on for so long. Right. And you don't have a real relationship with Jesus that's fueling your faith. Religious activity does not substitute for a real relationship with Jesus. So many people are busy doing the work of the Lord that they, they've ignored the Lord of the work. All these examples, they're, they're poison of, the, of, of religion, it, religion brings a slow death. We slowly decay, we slowly die, but Jesus isn't a religion. He's a person. Amen. Jesus is a person to be known. In this series, we're gonna take a journey through the scriptures. We're gonna rediscover the personality of Jesus that we've overlooked. We're gonna stop reading the Bible and reading the accounts of Jesus that are full of personality and putting our filters of, of, of sterilized, you know, serious Jesus interpreting his life through the filter of your religion. We're gonna really rediscover the real Jesus because only then can we have a real relationship that produces real power, real life, and real peace. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna, don't push back on me, okay? Give me, give me a little bit. I want to take you on a journey. Let me take you somewhere for today and hopefully over the next several weeks, okay, that we would really know the real Jesus. And here's the first topic today. I want you to know, hey, guys, Jesus has fun. Amen. Do you know that? Dude, like when I, when I say that, I, I, I can, some of you right now are getting a little, oh, wait, wait a second. What kind of fun are you talking about here? What kind of fun? How much fun? How much? Because this is, this is, and I know, I know, I get it, I get it. We like to, because Jesus is holy and he's to be revered, but he's fully God and fully man. I think we've robbed Jesus. Look, God created laughter. Do you know this? He created laughter. God created a, a, a sense of humor, okay? And he, we were created in the image of God. God named Isaac, Isaac, and Isaac means laughter, Okay, so God created, and there is so much humor, all, and there's so much of Jesus' personality that he does like to have fun, and he is, the title of today's message is, The Playfulness of Jesus, that Jesus can play. Do you guys know that? 
And, and when we rob Jesus of this, of this element of his personality, and we sterilize him, I'm telling you, we're robbing the, a real relationship with the real Jesus. It's one of the overlooked and misunderstood parts of Jesus that you can actually, like God, John says, like he wants you to enjoy life, to experience the real relationship with the real Jesus. I mean, it's all over the place, and I only have time to go through a few of them, but just the, the ki kids, little kids, were attracted and drawn to Jesus. They would run to him. He'd sit them in, their, in his lap and, and carry them. His disciples would try to, no, 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 don't let them come. He said, no, 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 suffer not the children. Let them come, man. How many of you know you got to be a little bit silly or goofy for kids to be drawn to you? Right? Some of you here know kids hate you because you are a boring snob, okay? And you know it. So you, kids are attracted to people who are, you know Jesus got to be like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, he's just got to have fun with the kids. He got candy in his pocket, like, and no, I don't know about that. But he was, <laughs> Jesus had, he must have been, a, in order to be attractive to kids, post-resurrection Jesus, I got a couple of stories to share with you of the post-resurrection Jesus, the Sunday after Easter. I got two of them to share with you, but one of them I couldn't fit it in. Right after the resurrection, I mean, again, we read the Bible and we sterilize it. We sterilize Jesus from being, because do you understand that Jesus, these were his friends. His disciples were his friends. And he, he's like, these were his boys. And just after the resurrection, the disciples were in the upper room and the Bible says the doors were locked. And Jesus appears in the room and says, peace be with you. And we read that and we're like, oh, look at holy Jesus. He's so, he's so miraculous. I gotta think this Jesus is having fun, man. Jesus, you know, that word peace be with you translated today is chill out, guys. It's okay. It's me. He appeared in a locked room. Okay, he could have done a, a lot of different things. To, he could have knocked on the door and made something spiritual about it, right? I stand at the door. Thou enter, open at the door, and I will come in, and now I will eat with you. And you. And he could have made something spiritual about it, but he didn't. He just showed up and was like, ah, it's me, guys. Just don't be afraid. Chill out. Peace, peace, peace. He was having fun with his friends, which just a moment ago, just days earlier, Jesus actually said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. You're my friends. I want to have a relationship with you. I think we've just missed this. I think we sterilized Jesus too much. We forgot that he can actually be playful, and he can be playful with us, and we can have a little bit of fun. Okay, let me, let me share with you um, a few stories. Here's the third time Jesus appears to his disciples. It's like seven days after his resurrection. In John chapter 21, the Bible says it happened like this. Like before this scripture, you can go read it. The, the disciples were hanging out, and, and Peter told the rest of the disciples, he said, hey, what do you guys think we should do? We're bored. And he said, let's, let's go fishing. They're like, yeah, let's go back fishing. And so they go back, listen, they go back doing the same thing that they were doing before Jesus. And Jesus shows up on the scene when they were going back to normal life as usual. It says at dawn, Jesus was standing there on the shore. Again, let's re read this with me. Not stripping Jesus of his personality. But the disciples didn't realize that it was him. So he's a, he was far distance away. He called out to them. He didn't say, it is I, your Lord and Savior. No, he said, hey, guys, you catch any fish? Just staying, staying, staying coy about who he is. Not a thing, they replied. Jesus shouted to them, throw your net over to the other side, and you'll catch some. They're, surely you're going to catch some over there. And so they did, as he said, and they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull in the net. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is always hilarious to me, because that John, and John's the one writing this, so John, John's like, and then his favorite one, <laughs> the one he loved more than everybody else, you know, it's just, <laughs> the one the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, now picture this with me. This is, this is post-resurrection Jesus, the keys to hell dangling on his belt. You know, he's, the Bible says for 40 days, he was, he was just popping into places and talking to people and, and doing things and showing up places. Here is the post. He's got reason to celebrate and reason. And he just stayed, hey guys, you, you got anything? And how about throwing, why don't you try the other side? Maybe you're, you're going to catch something over there. Jesus is actually doing something that was very familiar to his disciples. He actually called Peter 
this exact same way. For those of you that know your Bibles or read your Bibles, this is a miracle that he's repeating. So this Jesus, listen, this is what Jesus is pranking his friends. This is what's happening here. Jesus is going, oh yeah, how about you try that other side? You have, Jesus is not like, like, and you know, I am the man. Yeah, there's a hundred or something fish. He's not, that's, Jesus is, has to be in this situation. You got to see him laughing, enjoying it. Peter then, after this, jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus, and they eat there on the shore. This is, we sterilize it though. Again, Jesus here is having fun with his boys. He's having fun on his boys at this moment, okay? I want you to see the personality. Again, Jesus can have fun. Here's another story. It's the morning of, of the resurrection. The morning of, of the resurrection, some of Jesus' followers were traveling to Emmaus. And you guys may have read this story before, but again, um, missing the personality of Jesus. So let me try, let me, let's read it together, and let's read it with personality. Let's, let's, let's not remove and strip Jesus of, of, of really who he is. It says that same day, the same day of the, the, the resurrection, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. So it was a little bit of a trek. And it says as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. So they didn't know about the resurrection yet. This is still fresh. And they're talking about like, like oh my gosh, can you believe what happened? That's why they're, they, they talked about these things, it says. And Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with him. He just, just shows up in stride, but God kept them from recognizing him. So Jesus nonchalantly just shows up, and I don't know if he was wearing the glasses with the, with the mustache and the nose kind of thing, but he's, whatever, he's probably not doing that, but he, whatever he's doing, he's disguising. He's hiding himself, and he just, just starts striding with some of his followers, and then he asks them, what are you guys discussing so intently as you walk along? I mean, what's the hubbub in Jerusalem these days? I wouldn't know. You know, just I want you to see this. This is Jesus. He's hiding himself, and he comes along, just starts walking alongside, acting like he doesn't know. What's, what's wrong with you guys? What's going on here? Okay? They stopped short of sadness. Go back up for me real quick. They stopped short of sadness, um, written across their faces. Then one of them... Cleopas replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about the things that have happened there these last few days. I mean, you must be a, like, foreigner. And then Jesus replies, look at this. What things? (laughs) This is so rich with personality. Like, Jesus plays coy. He feigns ignorance with him, like, like just in stride, hiding himself, acting like he doesn't know. These, these followers of Jesus, you go read the story, they begin to tell him, like, man, about, you, you must, you miss it. There's this Jesus, and this is what happened. He was a miracle. He's a Messiah. But then they killed him, and they betrayed him, and they just tell him, and then Jesus is like, oh, oh, really? But you know what, guys? I think there's some prophets that spoke about this. I think Moses or David, and he's having just a scriptural discussion for seven miles with these followers just hiding himself. And then it says, it continues in verse 28, by this time they were nearing Emmaus, so they're walking up quite a while with Jesus, just kind of sharing the scripture. And at the end of their journey, look at this, please. Jesus acted as if he were going on. How did we miss this before? How do we miss the rich personality of Jesus? Are you kidding me? Jesus, hey, good talking to you guys. We'll see you later. You know, he's just, just acting as if he was going to continue. He really was, he was just playing with him, acting. And then it says that they had to beg him. Look, they had to beg him to say, he's like, no, 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 I got to see a guy about a thing. I got to see a guy about a thing. And, and it's, I'm really busy. I'm really busy. And they have to beg him. What do they say? It continues, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he finally caved in after begging and he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. And the Bible says he broke it. And that kind of sparked something in them. And he gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that very moment, poof. What happened? What is this? This is so weird, right? This is, you, you, you can interpret this verse in a few different ways about Jesus' behavior. Jesus' behavior was either bizarre, like he's weird. This is a weird resurrected Jesus. 
or, or there's some obscure spiritual principle that he's trying to teach that in the backdrop of his resurrection and everything, it's like even more bizarre and weird. Or three, he's being playful with his disciples. And granted that he created laughter, he created sense of humor, he's pranking his boys just a few days later. This, my money is on Jesus is not weird or bizarre. He's being playful with his, with his friends. And, and I just think, like, like, listen, is this the Jesus you know? Is, is this what you come to expect in your walk with Jesus? Is, is this the Jesus you pray to? Is this what you expect from Jesus? Can, can Jesus be playful with you? Do you expect? See, this is so important for us to understand because a lot of us that, that are poisoned by religion, we separate fun from faith. And it was never meant to be that way. It was never meant to be. God wants you to experience life and life to the full. He wants you to enjoy life. And it's not the enjoyment that the world has and the world has to offer because the joy that God has to offer won't rob you of anything. It won't rob you of your family, rob you of your finances, rob you of your peace or your purpose. The joy that Jesus has to offer is life and life abundantly. And some of us think that, oh, I've got to die to myself and less of me and more of him is this like dull life. No! Absolutely, it's, that's, that's not it at all. It's okay to have fun. God wants you to experience joy and laughter. So if Jesus was playful and, and, and if he enjoyed his friends and enjoyed life, what can we do to be more like Jesus in this way? So let me get practical here now because what WWJD takes on a different meaning now, right? What would Jesus do? Let me give you really practically now three things. Number one is slow down. Listen, some of you, your hurry is hurting you. You're in such a hurry, you cannot enjoy life. That's what Job says in Job chapter 9. He says, my days go by faster than a runner, and they fly away without me seeing any joy. It's just going so fast. I thought about this verse when he said, my days fly away. I thought about sometimes I travel in, in, by plane. I go across the country, and when I'm going across the country, I can either see clouds or sometimes I see cities, but I can't enjoy them because I'm flying by. I didn't enjoy Phoenix or or, or Chicago, or, or uh, all, Virginia, or places that I f just flew over. I didn't enjoy them. I just, oh, that's, that's cool. And it, but what happens if you just slow that down and you, you take a car ride through the country? You'd experience, listen, you'd see more, you'd hear more, you'd experience more. Look, your faith in Christ, this relationship was always meant so that you would see, you would hear, and you'd experience Jesus. So what would happen even if you, if you got out of the car and you took a walk? and you took a leisurely stroll, I'm telling you, you would see, hear. Look, you, some of you need to slow down so you can see, hear, and experience more of Jesus. Slow down. Here's some reasons to slow down, not in your notes, but really quickly. Number one, we are pursuing transformation, not information. That's why you slow down. Because we're not, it's, the, the goal is not to become an information database. No, the goal is to become Christ-like, to be transformed to the image of his son. Secondly, real growth happens it takes a long time. We're living in this age of like fast food, fast internet, fast transportation, fast computers, fast everything, social media, fast. It's only getting faster. This is now becoming an assumption of our faith, but that is not the God. The God we serve is not fast. He's never in a hurry. Sometimes he's so slow that he exasperates us. Real growth takes time. There are no life hacks for holiness. Come on, somebody, hashtag that. Come on, somebody, quote that later, okay? That, that we, are, we cannot love. This is why you still don't. You can't love what you don't linger over. And that's true of any area of your life. You can't really love something that you don't pause and linger. Slow down because your hurry is hurting you. Here's the second thing we can take away from Jesus' personality, and that is laugh more. Like, get some more laugh in your life. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to have fun. Actually, one person in the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our, is our strength. What if, what if joy was really the indicator of how strong you are? How strong are some of you? When was the last time you had a good laugh? Like a belly hurting, crying laugh. You need to make some time. Actually, Ecclesiastes tells us that there is a time. We study this. A time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to weep and a time to laugh. Some of y'all need to take more time to laugh, 
to bring some more laughter. And you can find laughter in a lot of places if you just look for it. If you just if you need to find laughter in your life, go spend time with a funny friend. Or get, a, get around some kids. Get around more kids. Because they, they, like, kids are funny, man. They'll say some crazy things, okay? You need to get around some more kids in your life. Because when you tell a kid, you tell a kid, hey, draw me this, draw this. Or you tell a kid, hey, do that, do that dance. What do they do? They do it, right? But if I were to tell some of you guys, hey, can you draw me this? Or if I tell you, hey, do that one dance, do that one dance, you'd be like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know. Why? You know that fear of, of adults want to be accepted so much. Kids don't care. They don't, they, don't, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know they're no good at drawing or dancing. They just do it. And because of that, they have fun and they learn. See, our fear of rejection, our fear of failure prevents us. When we, when, it prevents us from having fun. It prevents us from, do, from learning because we never do new things. You guys, it's, it, you, need to, you need to experience some more laughter in your life. Proverbs 17, 22 says a cheerful heart is actually good medicine. And in that, that crushed, sour face you always got, got on and stuff, man, that is crushing your spirit. That God, there's actually been a lot of studies on this. There's, it produces health, laughter, and joy. It, re, it, it releases things into your life that can actually produce health. You need to laugh more. Some of you need to laugh more at yourself. Just laugh at yourself a little bit more. Listen, if you laugh at yourself, you can forgive yourself. I've noticed that. If you can't laugh at yourself, you usually can't forgive yourself. Look, but if you can laugh at yourself, you can not only forgive yourself, but you can forgive others too. Which brings me to this last point. I want to make you guys, don't take yourself too seriously. That serious picture of Jesus and what it means to be Christ-like, and I get it, holiness, honor, respect, reverence, but don't take yourself too seriously. Okay, I don't care what your job is either. Your job can be so serious. You don't need to be serious all the time. All right? Can you laugh at yourself? Can you, you know, that's, that's the problem of taking ourselves so seriously. We choose to look good over learning new things. Fear makes our lives boring and repetitive. Look what Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says. But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for, and men and women. women. He says, really, it's quite simple. You're making it too hard. You're making it too difficult. You're making it about all the things that you can do. Really, it's not, just just do what's fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal and love. Just love God and love people. And don't take yourself too seriously. But take God seriously. Now, he's he's not taking, oh, because God is serious. No, what he's saying is, Hey, you're doing the opposite. And maybe some of you have been done the opposite. Maybe you've taken your life so seriously and you're not taking God serious enough. That you're not giving him the thought, the attention, the focus. Maybe your picture of Jesus was a cold figure of the past instead of the real person that you can know, that you can have a relationship with. That's the power of our faith. It's not in the doing. It's not in the knowing, but it's in who we know, a real relationship with the real Jesus. Come on, let's bow our heads all across this worship center and close our eyes for a moment because there are some of you that are here.